Senua is a character that has garnered considerable success among critics and fans because of the way she is written and performed. She is a character upon which anyone can relate to, whether that person has mental illness or not, because we all have issues and Hellblade is all about accepting, overcoming, or learning to live with one's issues. In the previous video, in which I theorized on Hellblade's finale, I proposed the possibilities of some things having happened for real in the game. Today, I want to elaborate further on that topic, this time through Senna's point of view, and how the dichotomy of real versus delusional actually helps the character, not only in the presence of Hellblade Senna's sacrifice, but through the rest of the saga as well. Personally, I believe that not all in Senna's story is within her mind. I believe that there are real and supernatural aspects within this game as well. Although I at first thought them unnecessary, it is the real aspect of the game what makes Hellblade unique from other stories like Don Juan de Marco and Beautiful Mind, the same way that the psychological twist makes Senua a different character from Hercules, Perseus, Beowulf, and so many others. In Don Juan, we have our lead acknowledging reality versus hallucination, but he willingly embraces his fantasies in order to overcome the loss of his father. The movie even ends with a positive outlook on John de Marco's condition through the voice of his doctor, Jack Miller. And how does our fable end? His Donna Anna, his centerfold. Was she waiting all eternity on the beach for him to return, as they had promised each other? Why not? Sadly, I must report that the last patient I ever treated, the great lover Don Juan de Marco, suffered from a romanticism which was completely incurable, and even worse, highly contagious. Beautiful Mind presents the opposite, a brilliant but shy man who unwillingly hallucinates during the first half of the movie. Midway, we are presented with a thunderous twist that the spy thriller we've been witnessing all this time is just inside his mind. Afterwards, he spends the rest of his life learning how to control his illness, eventually learning how to identify reality from illusion and reaching true fulfillment in being able to carry on a relatively normal and productive life within his condition. An important detail in these two movies is that in both of them, we have characters like Jack Mickler in Don Juan de Marco and Alicia Nash in Beautiful Mind that represent the real world. Through these characters, we can see reality, different from the fantasy of the two mentally disordered leads. In Hellblade, however, we have no such reference. All we know is what Senna sees, and since we are informed, and it is quite evident as well, from the very beginning, that she suffers from delusions, then we can never trust what we see in the game as real or not. We imagine that it's delusional, but we are never sure as long as we are inside Senna's mind. Imagine if William Parcher, after all indications of him being imaginary, actually exists. How different would John Nash's story have been? That's Hellblade. Delusion with real peril. Personally, I like to think the game handles both ideas because, at least to me, it makes the story more intense and her accomplishments greater. It's like when Batman fights Scarecrow in any Batman story. Not only does he have to deal and escape from the mental delusions the Scarecrow creates at risk of getting lost forever, 
but he also has to deal with real-life dangers. During those mental voyages, Batman could get himself killed or permanently hurt, or even worse, afflict someone else, possibly an innocent person. So, there is double danger when facing the Scarecrow. That is without saying that the feared toxin, after long exposure, could permanently damage Bruce's mind. When one cannot trust what he sees, then any danger increases tenfold. It is like hallucinating within a zombie world. Or think about Hercules hallucinating while fighting the Nemean lion. Think about Perseus hallucinating with the very deadly Medusa, circling him from the shadows. Then imagine him seeing more than one Medusa, and he shields himself from the wrong one. That, to me, is what makes Senwa different from these other mentioned heroes. Ultimately, the real-life feat is even greater, if not only the hero defeats the lion or the Medusa, but does it with a sort of handicap, in this case, mental disorder. The same way her inner struggles and victories are even more meaningful if she, like Batman, had to overcome them while surrounded by real threats. All of these are examples that explain why I think Hellblade entertains and should never clarify one point of view from the other, at least on Sema's perspective. Another reason to why I want to think there is reality in Sema's journey is because in doing so, I also address a typical problem any person with mental disorder has, and that problem is credibility. Once you get stamped with a tag mentally unstable, your life is ruined because everything you say will be taken with a grain of salt or even worse, scoffed at completely. This is something bad, because rejection of a person's ideas simply because he is a little nuts is not only inconsiderate, but cruel, and that, in no way, is going to help that person get any better. Psychotic people can sometimes see the truth as well, and although you should be wary of what they say, because their perception of things is different to that of the normal folk, you should still lend them an ear and consider their thoughts and views. Simply said, if a crazy person tells you there is smoke in the barn, you should check it out before going to sleep, just in case this time the psychotics are reality and not hallucinations. It doesn't cost you anything, and it gives you peace of mind. It also builds trust between you and your psychotic friend. If that person has been able to identify reality from hallucinations, then that person might think it twice before compromising your trust with his mental weirdness because you listened when he spoke the truth. This is similar to the way young people at times treat old people. Usually, the young disregard the elders as senile, and although senility is a common thing among the old, it does not mean that person is stupid or not worthy of your trust and attention. Old people can still gift us with their wisdom and friendship, so yes, even if their brain works slower than the young ones, it is still necessary for us to treat them with respect, because they know things we don't, they have the experience we lack. In other words, if the old man tells you there is smoke in the barn, please check it out, just in case. That way, the old man is satisfied because you listen to his warning, and you get a peace of mind. If the old man gives you an advice, please consider it. Mostly his advice is based on grounded experience, one we lack, so consider him, and he will be happy and more decisive in providing in the future even more helpful advice. The truth is, my young fellow friends, that our fathers and mothers, our grandfathers and grandmothers, carry the wisdom earned after a lifetime of living a life harder than ours so we could benefit from their labor. We owe it to them not only to care for them in their old age, but listen to their words, because their advice will not last forever, and the last thing we want is to live with regret. How I wish I'd known my grandmother when I was older. I was too young when she died and could benefit too little from her experience. The same applies with mentally ill people. Not trusting them is like not trusting John Nash during class. This is something that is addressed lightly in Hellblade, on the moment in which Senna goes to the river with Dillion and other villagers, only to find out that 
there is plague in the water. She warned the people. The people did not listen, and when the dead started piling, they laid the blame on her and tried to burn her alive. Selma was insane, but she saw reality there and no one listened. Whether it was her mind's eye which revealed the future or the presence of death in the water to her, or that she honestly saw a dead cow in the water and wanted to help, is not important for us to decipher now. The point is that what she perceived was true, and no one listened. Those people at the river did not check if there was true smoke in the barn and paid a heavy price. Due to the way Celtic society was formed during that era, those with mental illness were tagged as gelts and expected to live on their own to the woods to search for penance or purge a curse. The biggest irony is that the village annihilation happened when she was far, far away. Who can say? Maybe had Senna remained with Dillian at their village, the same instinct that warned her years before of plague at the river would have warned her of the Viking attack that destroyed them in the game. Maybe Senna would have gone to Dillian and said something like, um, Dillian, Vikings are coming! And Dillian, wise, caring, respectful husband that he is, would have listened. He would have even said on the benefit of the doubt, particularly now after the events of the river, and taken action. He would have ordered scouts to check the perimeter in case the Vikings are closer, and all the while he would have prepared the village for a defense or retreat plan. Who can say? Possibly, if Senna had remained in the village, most of them would be alive, and the story would have been written differently to the way it did. But since people didn't care for what the poor mad lady had to say, they tacked her as guilt and threw her out their door. The same happened to her mother, Galina, who was another victim of psychosis, and apparently was similarly cursed with the capacity of foreseeing things because ultimately people thought she was the bringer of the tragedies and not the messenger warning them for their own good. Little Senwa would often hear the term monster in regards to her mother, a term that would tag her as well in the future. Senua, don't cry. The world needs people like us. Because we reveal the secrets that they are blind to. Sometimes when we dream of a coming storm, they may think we've brought the storm with us. What they say about me is not true. They are just scared. We must forgive them. We must forgive them. My point is that because a person is mad, it does not mean that that person is not worthy of others' trust, and that is why I like to consider that there is truth in Senna's journey, because in doing so I validate the character and avoid falling into the mistake of disregarding that type of person. Senna, in some ways, reminded me of Joan of Arc, particularly the way she is depicted in the film The Messenger. The movie presents us at the beginning with a nearly biblical retelling of Joan's past and why she is illuminated by God. She predicts the crowning of Charles VII and is steadfast in leading the French to victory. The point is, she does. Joan of Arc saved the French from ultimate defeat at the hands of the British during the Hundred Years' War, and even though the movie exposes Joan to the gruesome realities of war, and those realities come at odds with her religious outlook of things, and at the ending, during her capture, she is confronted by advocates, real and imaginary, that her actions were not the word of God, but her own violent impulses to seek revenge on the Brits for the death of her family, it is still undeniable that her accomplishments were very real, and that it is very strange that one peasant girl could know and do so many things on her very own, when more experienced generals and churchmen were failing. So, was Joan of Arc mad, or was she truly the hand of God? Was she a true saint, or heretic? The same applies with Senna, because the truth is the character is depicted both ways in the story, and I personally believe she is both mad and seer. In any case, 
how different is one from the other, particularly during ancient times. The game even implies that her condition of seeing patterns where others could not was also an important factor that allowed her to become a truly gifted warrior. Gameplay-wise, the voices in her head warns the player of incoming attacks. For as annoying as the voices were, I was glad they were always with me during several intense fights of the game. Also, dying in the game is interpreted as a sort of premonition, a possible outcome to your actions. I understand that the direction of Hellblade's design was and still is psychosis, and I respect and admire the designers for going all the way with their idea and making this beautiful game that delivers such a powerful message. But from a fictional point of view, from a game's point of view, I believe that Hellblade should never clarify entirely one idea from the other. It also makes the writing a bit easier. In any case, it doesn't even have to be true supernatural elements. I am talking about reality, validation of the character, not magic, because the way the game ends makes you feel as if everything was imaginary, and it sounds and feels right from a surface level. But when you start looking back at the rest of the story, you realize that the game's ultimate twist actually can do as much harm as it does good. Everything was inside your mind, a crazy lady, including the plague-infested water that killed hundreds of people. Next time you taste death in your water, gulp it down. You know, my father used to have premonitions when he was younger. It wasn't anything dramatic and certainly not worth the while of filmmakers or video game designers, but he would wake up with bad feelings. I remember that sometimes he would say to my mother, don't go to work today, and later we would hear in the news that a car accident had happened on the exact same highway she used every morning to go to work. I'm sure that in the 8th century they would have laid the blame on my father, and afterwards sought him out with pitchforks and torches. Or today, they would just say it's a matter of nerves, and offer him a shot to sedate him. Tamina Antoniadis once said in an interview that Hellblade is a historical fiction, and that the fantasy elements were all in Senna's mind. That outlook is interesting, and I like it over having true Norse gods and monsters roaming the countryside as in God of War, for example. What I want the most is for Selma to be validated, whether it be with fantasy elements or realism. If the first game is an introspective journey, then fine, but I wouldn't like to play the second game only to find out that all of those people she is leading in the trailer are all inside her head and none of them real. If she can lead these people with mental disorder, then that makes her accomplishments even more admirable. That is what made John Nash's story so important. That man studied and became a brilliant mathematician, got married, had a kid, became a teacher and changed the world's economics, and all of this he did with mental disorder. That is a true accomplishment. I would like Sano to be like that, to be able to make a difference in the real world, because it is here where we all have to live, one way or the other, one day or the next. And that, my friends, are my personal thoughts concerning the character of Sanwa, at least for now. For if I gather enough ideas for a sequel to this video, I will most certainly make one. My next Hellblade video will revolve around Ruth, although that will be next year, so please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss that next one. If you liked this video, press the like button and share your thoughts on the comments below. I enjoy reflecting with you, so I will return probably next month, but in case I don't, stay safe and have a very Merry Christmas. Love you all, and Happy New Year. Senua, there will be times that you will feel alone and exhausted, like a strange little fish swimming against the tides of the big ocean. 
Have the faith to let go and let the tide carry you away. Because the whole ocean is your home and it does not ask you to swim against it.